Hi, everyone. I'm Leah Charnin. I'm a counseling psychologist here at Southeast Psych, and I'm going to be talking to you today about psychology. I know, shocking. So when clients come into the office, they're oftentimes questioning about different ways of working in therapy. And these questions can come up sometimes about what different methods of therapy are. So, for example, cognitive behavior therapy, dialectic behavior therapy, all these different terms that we throw around within our field. And I'm a therapist who does both individual and group therapy. I focus on issues related to anxiety, depression, and trauma work. And within those domains, there's a lot of acronyms that we tend to throw around. So within the office, we decide to create a series that's kind of the ABCs of psychology. So we can create a more conversational dialogue about what the heck different modalities of therapy are. So you're more informed as a client when you come into a session. I'm going to start off with a couple of different acronyms and the jargon that we like to throw around and also present a couple of different examples that we might use in a session. So really a applying this to an individual client. So I'm going to start off with an acronym that many of us know, and that acronym is Cognitive Behavior Therapy, or CBT. This is a fundamental form of treatment that has been demonstrated to be effective for a range of problems, including depression, anxiety disorders, substance use, even marital issues, severe mental illness. Because here's the thing. Cognitive just means a way of thinking. It's what are the thoughts that are rolling around in our heads that also result to patterns of problematic thinking. That is some language in CBT or maybe some problematic behaviors in our lives or things, behaviors that are maintaining pain and emotional difficulties. When we talk about CBT, there are several core principles, including psychological issues like unhelpful or faulty ways of thinking. In CBT, we might call this a cognitive distortion. Some cognitive distortions are overgeneralizing. So, for example, one event comes up. And I'm going to go back to a client who was a mid-20 graduate student who came in a lot of anxiety. I mean, grad school is stressful, so a lot of anxiety and worry about her own performance and perceived failures in life. And so this grad student had just made a C on an assignment. And technically in grad school, you have to make A's and B's in a class in order for you to not to retake this class. So she was really worried about having to retake this class, even though it wasn't an F, that C could have resulted in that. And so her overgeneralizing pattern was I just made the C in an assignment and therefore I am going to have to retake this class. Do you see how that kind of jumped from one event happened to this entire life altering event could occur? That's kind of an overgeneralized pattern of thinking that arrives from fear. And in CBT, we look at emotions quite a bit too because those interact with the way that we think. Another cognitive distortion might be fortune telling. So we're predicting what's going to happen in the future or maybe even predicting what we think another person is thinking. This individual who I was working with was also really experiencing a lot of social anxiety. And so that person was worried about going to social events because of fear that others were judging her. With that experience, she was assuming the judgment was happening without any other evidence, right? It was just in her head. But that fortune telling or mind reading is another way to say it was coming up for her. She also had a lot of shoulds. And in CBT, we kind of joke as therapists, we're a little nerdy like that, but we talk about this idea of are we shoulding all over ourselves? So for example, we should behave in a certain way in a certain environment. The more that we give ourselves these rules, the more anxiety, the more trouble we have managing uncomfortable emotions. So the overall idea with CBT is that we're wanting to help someone learn their own distortions that are creating problems. We're also going to help them examine how their emotions 
change and interact with those thoughts, and then the behaviors interact. So for example, in that social anxiety context, if my client was concerned about how others would think about her and was doing that mind reading and assumption, then she would feel fear and subsequently maybe not even go to a social event, maybe not have the opportunity to make friends. And so all of these factors, the emotion, the thoughts, the behaviors interact with each other. And that's what we're looking for in the cognitive triangle in CBT. There are a couple of other ways of working within a cognitive framework that are a little newer to the field. These are called third wave cognitive behavioral therapies. They're a group of emerging approaches to psychotherapy that represent both an extension and a deviation from traditional CBT. These therapies tend to incorporate more present moment mindfulness-based interventions, as well as dialectics. So I'm also going to talk to you about what the acronym ACT, or Acceptance Commitment Therapy, means, and also what DBT, or Dialectic Behavior Therapy, means. Let's start off with ACT. And this is one of my personal favorite theories. Of course, I'm biased because I tend to work from this perspective, actually. The goal of ACT is to increase psychological flexibility, which means being fully aware of this present moment. That could be, for example, increasing awareness of our thoughts and feelings, of our choices in the moment. So that awareness is huge in ACT. Second component of ACT is acceptance. You'll notice these concepts like how do we accept this present moment, my current emotions. Sometimes that's really hard. Do you ever notice that you're trying to push away from certain emotions that we perceive as particularly painful? So for example, fear, anxiety, worries, all of these emotions are really, really hard sometimes to manage, especially when they're intense. And so one of the tenets of ACT is how do I allow myself to feel this for a moment, reduce some of that tension of pushing away from the emotion, and then move through that moment. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we can only feel a certain way or speak a certain way. We have these rules that we place on the world and on ourselves. These rules we call cognitive fusion. It's kind of similar to CBT and those cognitive distortions. It's just a different term. But cognitive fusion means that we're so attached to these rules that we don't allow ourselves more flexible ways to act in the world. We also see ourselves in this very, very narrowed perspective. So, for example, we see limitations on ourselves or tell ourselves that we can only do certain things. That's the idea of self as context. It's the way that we perceive ourselves and our identity. The other tenet of ACT is this idea of, okay, we know these Things that are really important to us in our lives, so for example, our jobs, our relationships, um, presenting ourselves in ways in which we earn respect as intelligent, these are values that we have. And our values tend to shape what we do in our lives, our committed actions. So all of these components are included in ACT. If we were to go back to an example with a client, say the grad student I was talking about earlier... She came in thinking that the only way that she was of value is to be successful in graduate school. She was only honoring this value of being an educated, accomplished person. This individual with whom I was working wasn't necessarily honoring other values in her life. And so those values would be, for example, relationships, leisure time, hobbies, I did include leisure in there intentionally because we need to have a balanced perspective on life in order to really have a whole and healthy mindset. And so when we were identifying these other values in her life, she realized, wow, I'm really not attending to my relationships. I haven't called my mom in a week, which for her was abnormal. Or maybe I haven't really taken some time to go exercise, to attend to my body, to engage in other things that are important to me in my life because her mind and her rules were so set, fused, if you will, that she was telling herself she couldn't 
do anything else. She didn't have time for anything else. It's this very black or white thinking, which is similar to CVT. So in the end, when we, va- we, when we identified all of these values, we identified some committed actions that she could take. So for example, calling her mom, going for a walk with the dog, enjoying listening to some music, which all created opportunity for more balance and wellness within her life and increased psychological flexibility. The last acronym that I would like to talk to you about is another third wave, cognitive behavior intervention. This is called dialectical behavior therapy. This is a therapy that was developed by Marsha Linehan, and it has a couple of core components. First, mindfulness is infused in terms of being aware of this present moment. Distress tolerance is a second one, which helps individuals learn skills to tolerate really difficult emotions, intense emotions, rather than trying to escape from it. The third is emotion regulation. This covers strategies to manage intense emotions that are also causing problems, maybe just not quite as intense as that distress tolerance range. The fourth component is interpersonal effectiveness, which provides us skills with how to communicate with others. And that's right. We all need to learn skills to communicate because sometimes it's really freaking hard to communicate our emotions and our needs with other individuals. So DBT is a very skills-based therapy. It's used oftentimes and originally for borderline personality disorder and disorders that have more intense presentations with um, intense emotions, maybe even some self-harm and safety safety concerns. DBT has also been proven successful in individuals experiencing depression, disordered eating, bipolar disorder, even maybe PTSD and substance abuse, because it's really teaching you language and in-the-moment skills to use. In DBT, we also look at different parts of the mind and the way that it interacts. And so one part of the mind is maybe the emotional side of the mind. That's where the hot energy is, anxiety, fears, trepidations. The other side of the mind is called the reasonable mind. That's when we look at life and the way that our bodies, our emotions, our minds are working with maybe a scientific lens. The merging of the two is the wise mind or this place of how do we balance both the emotions and we identify what those are and the scientific facts and identify what our choices are. That's why we learn skills to be able to implement in the moment. In DBT, we oftentimes incorporate both individual and group therapy because there's a heck of a lot to learn. And in individual therapy, we fine tune when to use skills in life. And in group therapy, you tend to learn the skills in a supportive environment where everybody's learning these skills together. So I want to walk you through just a couple of brief examples with, so for example, if I were working with that former graduate student in a DBT perspective, we would use some skills and learn, for example, emotion regulation skill of please. This student wasn't necessarily attending to her body, her physical needs. An emotion regulation skill that we might use is please. The PNL is for physical illness. So this individual, for example, may not go to the doctor when she has a cold or get plenty of rest. So in what ways is she neglecting her physical wellness? E is for balanced eating. As a graduate student, you can imagine that those meals go on a pretty quick, not the most nutritious basis and just grabbing whatever she could eat. And so it's about how is she getting appropriate nutrients day to day. A is for avoiding mood-altering drugs. In grad school, she was drinking quite a bit, especially on Friday and Saturdays, waking up feeling pretty crummy in the morning, and that was impairing her attention and motivation through the day, which then interfered and increased her anxiety because she wasn't getting enough work done or the work that she wanted to get done on those Sundays before her successful work week. So that avoiding of mood-altering drugs in any form, can really help create more balance in her in her life. S is for sleep. So looking at sleep hygiene. 
What time are you putting down the phone before you go to bed? Are you resting, relaxing, doing homework before sleep? All of those pieces are really important to optimize the way our brain and our mood are functioning. E is for exercise. We all know that exercise is related to improved mental health and wellness, to reducing stress, anxiety, and overall more well-being. So that's an example of a skill and an acronym that you would learn in DBT in order to create more balance and effective coping throughout life. Overall, I've just gone through some of the core acronyms that we talk about in therapy as someone's trying to figure out what the best fit is for them. We reviewed CBT, or Cognitive Behavior Therapy, ACT, or Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and DBT, or Dialectical Behavior Therapy. Any of these therapies are effective. It's really about working with your therapist about what the most appropriate fit is for you. Feel free to do your homework, figure out what language you want to use in your day-to-day, and then you're able to incorporate that in therapy. And that's what I hope to give to you today through this bite. Again, this is Leah Charnin with Psych Bites. For more practical psychology to enhance your life, visit psychbites.com and our social media, Psych Bites.